Drinking a lot of coffee this past few days. I was uh, in Kansas City. Hey, Pastor Drew. Nice, nice to see you. I was in Kansas City at a youth ministry uh, conference for the last three days uh, with a couple other youth pastors, and it was just a joy even watching that Operation Christmas Child. One of the other pastors was already singing Christmas songs in the car. <laughs> He's like, I'm trying to hold off until after Thanksgiving, but I just can't help myself. And we had a great time, and honestly, uh, coming back from that conference, there's a couple of challenges preaching the next day. One is I've just heard so many amazing speakers that I feel inadequate. Uh, but on the other side, I'm so encouraged and inspired and refreshed by the things that I heard. Uh, I have a newfound just amazement uh, over God, uh, the gospel as just being abundantly life-giving, and the Bible is just so beautiful. The word is so important. And so we're just going to start this morning, before I even really touch on anything of the message, let's open up to John 15, which will be our primary text for the, today. And if you reach John 15 and you are able to, please stand with me. John 15, we'll be starting in verse 1. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. If you're newer to Bethel or newer to the idea of standing as we read God's word, I just want to encourage you. It's just a way for us to show reverence, to show honor and respect to this living word of God that we have. So starting in verse 1 of John chapter 15, it says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete or full. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again and again this morning just to acknowledge your goodness, your justice, your mercy, your grace. We acknowledge that this is your holy word that you have written. So Lord, as we have heard it, spoke out loud, as we've read with our own eyes, I pray that you would already be doing that work by the Holy Spirit to change us and transform us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as I speak, would you remove any distractions? Or would you remove anything that I have planned to say that will not bear fruit for your kingdom? May you be honored and glorified in all we do this morning. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The vision for the Bethel Youth Ministries... It coincides with this declare, develop, and deploy, but we have a, a more nuanced approach specific to the youth ministries. And what I want to see is for every student to be deeply connected to the vine of Jesus Christ, both before and after their graduation. 
I want every student that comes to our youth ministry and spends any amount of time with us to understand how important it is to remain in Jesus, to abide with our Savior. So that during their middle school and high school career, they are learning what it looks like to be close with their Savior. For the purpose then of after graduating, they will not become a statistic. Now, students, I love you, and I don't think any of you are a statistic, but the statistics speak something powerful. Barna research shows that 70% of high school graduates end up leaving college with little to no faith. 70%. Lifeway research says about 70% stop going to church, period, after high school. So they leave high school, and whatever they do, if they go to college, if they go to the workforce, if they do some type of gap year program, they end up not even attending church. Now, this research gave about five reasons the students give as to why they stopped going to church. And here are some of those reasons. They moved away. Uh, the church had too many judgmental and hypocritical people. There was no connection to people in the church. They didn't feel actually connected to one another as the body of Christ, as the family of believers. Four, there was social or political differences that they couldn't coincide with their current worldview. And fifth was simply because their work schedule wouldn't accommodate for that. Now as I read those, it can become discouraging, right? It can become disappointing. But really what stood out to me is there's something very absent in these reasons that were given by all these students as to why they stopped going to church. Did you catch what is missing? There's no mention of God. There's zero mention of Jesus. There's no mention of true faith. It's all these external issues that they see that stops them from going to church, but not a single one of them mentioned Jesus as a reason. Jesus was not a part of the equation. Whereas on the flip side, those who continue to go to church and those who continue to uh, pursue a faith in Jesus Christ, well over 50% of those respondents said that church is a vital part of their relationship with God. The church is a key aspect of how they remain connected to Jesus. And so, my students in the room, and ultimately every one of us, we must be deeply connected to the vine, both before and after we graduate, both before and after we get married, both before and after we enter the workforce. Whatever your life situation is, my plea today is to be deeply connected to the vine of Jesus Christ. And that is our vision in the youth ministries, is I want students, by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit, to be able to grasp just how important that relationship is, how important their walk with Jesus truly is, that it's not this secondary or tertiary thing that's just an add-on to their life, but is a part of the life-giving projection that they are moving out into this world with, that Jesus has to be tied into their life. And so looking back at John 15 and thinking of this mission for and mission and vision for the youth ministries, we have to understand what abiding is. And so I want to say this, abiding in Jesus, first, is our only hope really for accomplishing any of these missions or visions that we have. And so in John 15, we see the word abide or remain 11 times in these 18 verses. John is trying to get us to hone in on this word, abide, to remain. In fact, in the book of John, he uses it 40 times, whereas in the other Gospels, it's only used five, roughly. 40 times, John loves this idea of abiding, of remaining. In fact, in, in 1 John, just a short little book later on, he uses it 24 times. John is addicted to this idea of abiding, of remaining close to. And it's used in different contexts. Yes, throughout the book of John, abiding has to do with closeness physically. It's frequently used when Jesus is calling his disciples to literally stay with him overnight. Come stay with me in this place. And then it says they wake up the next morning and they go out. They remained with him. They abided with Jesus. 
And when it's not talking about a physical closeness, there's this level of immaterial or non-physical reality that John is implying where there is a union of two things to make one. John uses it in, in different contexts, but it's always this idea of either physical closeness or a, a greater reality, a spiritual, spiritual uh, reality of union, of unity of two things. And so abiding has to do with closeness. And so the, the call for children in the children's ministry, the call for students in the youth ministry, the call for adults, if you are a Christ follower, the call for us is to abide. To be in deep relationship and relational connection with Jesus. Tethered to Him. United in Him. And when we do this, we will look like Jesus. Let's look again at John 15, verses 9 through 17. He says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain or abide in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I, just as I have obeyed the Father's commands and remain in His love. We are not doing anything other than what Jesus Himself did, which was abide in His Father, and we too are to abide in Jesus. And He continues on, And I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. We will look like Jesus the more we abide because the joy that Jesus had will be the joy that he places in your life. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus is not calling us to any other standard that he himself has not already lived up to. Jesus is calling us to do exactly what he did, which is to love one another deeply. He says that in verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, right? Jesus was a learner from his father. Wrap your mind around that. I have made known to you. And you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit that will last. Over and over again, we see what Jesus is calling us to in abiding with him is the exact same thing that he did in his life on earth. Was he ab abided, he remained with the Father. And as he did so, it wasn't this stagnant, static abiding. Abiding meant doing. Abiding meant movement. Remaining with Jesus meant that when Jesus moved, I moved with him. Otherwise, I would be no longer remaining or abiding with Jesus. And so part of it is giving up our lives as we love each other, making sacrifices to show the love of Jesus, just as Jesus made the greatest sacrifice for us and showed us his great love. And so discipleship, if you are in this room and you say, yes, I am a disciple of Jesus, I am a follower, I have placed my faith in him, discipleship involves and requires a constant move me, moving with the one with whom you're abiding. Otherwise, you don't abide. And so if you've placed faith in Jesus, I want to have you ask yourself, and I have to ask myself this question too, is how am I abiding? My, my students in this room, I love you. How are you abiding with Jesus. What do you do to remain close to Him? What do you do on a regular basis that causes you to feel united, to be tied to your Savior? And in the youth ministries, one of the ways we try to accomplish this is on Wednesday nights we have a, a program called Shalom. And really, for an hour, all it is is abiding. It's where we just sit down. I maybe start with a short devotional, five minutes, and then the students just open up God's Word and read. Or they open up their journal and they start to write. Or they just sit there, eyes closed, talking to their God. It's a practice that the students are taking on Wednesday nights to learn how to abide, how to stay with Jesus, how to be close and draw near to Him. And now there are some essentials that we see in this passage of, of how do we actually abide what does it look like when we abide? And so there's three essentials when it comes to abiding. And first is this. Abiding in Jesus requires believing in Jesus. 
I know that seems basic and simple, but you cannot abide in Jesus if you have not already professed faith in him. And we see this in John 14, 6. It talks about how Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He says later on, talking to the disciples still in verses 16 through 17, that I will ask the Father and he will give you the counselor to be with you forever. You know him for he lives in you. That this, this union has taken place already that allows them to abide because of faith in Jesus Christ. And then in 15.3, this passage, I don't see Jesus trying to be rebuking of his disciples. I don't think he's saying, strive harder and do better, bear more fruit. He says in verse 3, you are already clean. That's encouraging, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that if you have professed faith in Jesus, if you truly are in the family, you're already clean. By the power of Jesus' blood washing over you, you are set. You have the lifeblood of Jesus in you, coursing through your veins. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Now, I can remember back in November of 2020, uh, my wife and I took some nieces and nephews out to uh, an apple orchard. I don't know about you, even listening to Steph Eddy there talk about fall. I love fall. Fall is one of my favorite seasons, partially because after a long summer, all I do is sweat, basically. I sweat really easily. I know it's awkward, but it's true. It's like three showers a day kind of deal. So when I get to fall, I'm finally like, yes, I can spend more of my life outside of the shower. Like It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> But beyond just that, it's awesome because I love going to uh, apple orchards. My family grew up going to Edwards Apple Orchard. Anyone else go to Edwards? Yeah, we got quite a few. I love Edwards Apple Orchard. But we took our nieces and nephews out to an orchard back in 2020. And I remember as we were driving around in the tractor, the farmer was very proud of the things he was producing there. And it was, it was fun to see. And because I, I love scripture and I had in my mind Romans 11 where there's this talk about how uh, we are grafted into Jesus, how we're grafted into the true vine. And so I just asked the, the farmer, uh, what, is that, what does this process of grafting look like for you? And why is it important? And it was so interesting to hear from a farmer who actually did this as his living, to hear his care, to hear his heart behind it. Because he said, if you just take a seed from an apple and you plant it in the ground, you'll get a different type of fruit from that tree. Because what happens is as you plant that, there is a process of cross-pollination that just naturally happens. So you can't just simply plant a, a, a seed and expect to get the same fruit, expect to get the right results. He said, what you have to do is you have to clip off, you have to cut off one of the branches, and then with one of the new little trees, you have to make this little tea bud or something. I can't think what the word is now, but something like that. You have to make this little slit, slide that little branch in, and then seal it up. And then what happens is it ends up becoming deeply connected with that new vine. And that branch will bear exactly the fruit that it is designed to produce. This is the Christian life. We cannot abide in Jesus if we have not yet been called by Jesus. We cannot abide in our Savior if we have not yet received the love and grace of our Savior into our lives and have been connected by the Father into the life-giving vine. We see this all the way back in John chapter 14, all the way back in John chapter 6. It's throughout this book where he says that abiding proceeds from receiving the gospel. And so the first thing we have to keep going back to is that you cannot abide and bear fruit if you are not saved, if you do not have faith in Jesus. And that, at the youth ministry conference this weekend, they said that's one of the most polarizing things today, is to say that there's only one way to heaven, that there's only one true path. But Jesus says it boldly that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. And so to abide in Jesus requires that we believe in Jesus. And that's why the children's ministry is so important here. Because what they're doing is, they're not just planting seeds, which they are, but what they do is they're waiting for that moment for a child to profess faith and watch as God grafts them into the vine of Jesus. There has to be that deep connection to the Savior. 
And that's why youth ministry is so important. The statistics show that 94% of adults say they profess faith between the ages of 5 or 4 and 18. 94% of adults profess faith between the ages of 4 and 18. That is a prime opportunity for us as a church to be able to see the vision of this church go forward as we declare Christ to the young ones, to the youth, as we develop them and help them learn what it means to connect to Jesus and then to deploy them out even while they're in children's ministry, deploy them out even while they're still in youth ministry to do the work of God, to do the work of advancing this kingdom because they are a vital part of the vine. They are already connected. And so the question is, have you believed? I am firmly a believer in the fact that when we get up here to preach, we, and Pastor Drew does a great job of this, we should always be presenting the gospel. We should always be bringing this back to the forefront of our attention as believers and as unbelievers. And so if you're in here and you're like, I don't know, I've been sitting in here, and I don't know if actually I am a believer, I would encourage you to take that next step today to profess a faith in Jesus under the lordship of him who has created you. And if you're not sure what that looks like, please find me, find Pastor Drew, find someone else in this room who loves Jesus, and they will point you in the right direction. So first, abiding in Jesus requires believing in Jesus. But second, abiding in Jesus requires pruning by the Father. Look at 15, verse 2. He says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. God prunes the branches attached to Jesus in order that they may have greater fruitfulness. Pruning is this process of cutting away. It's a removal of something that is no longer bearing fruit or maybe never did bear fruit and now it is pulling away that life from other areas that could be producing good fruit. It's not pleasant. It's not enjoyable per se, but it is absolutely necessary. It is an essential part of how we abide in Jesus, is by allowing the Father to prune things, to cut things out of us and out of our lives that are inhibiting our fruitfulness, not for our own lives, but for the kingdom of God. Now, outreach ministry is difficult. I just want to say that up front, okay? I love youth and outreach ministry, but outreach ministry is tough. And one of the reasons outreach ministry is so tough is because it requires us to not do something else and to do something that for most of us is uncomfortable or unpleasant. It requires a level of pruning away something else in order that we may step into a role of seeing the world around us. And I'm not just talking about outreach events that we try to uh, put on here as a church. I'm saying outreach in my own life when I get home from work and I see my neighbor across the road getting into his car, it requires me to say no to going in and giving my beautiful little child the biggest hug, hearing her say, Papa, like I love that. It requires me to prune that away for a moment in order to spend time with my neighbor, to go out of my way to see how he's doing, to invest in his life. And even for me, I, I'm fairly extroverted, that's still uncomfortable for me. To a certain degree, to, to say no to that and then to walk across the road. So pruning is necessary. The question we need to ask ourselves is, what does God want to prune from us in order for us to become more fruitful for his kingdom? What does God want to prune from your life, from my life, in order that we can be more fruitful for his kingdom and his glory? We're going to come back to this verse later on. But it says in verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. It's not for Seth's glory. It's not for Drew's glory. It's not for our glory that we bear much fruit. It's for His glory alone. And so this pruning process, this cutting away, is not that we can be more fruitful in the ways that I want to advance in my career or advance in this or that. It's so that we can advance the kingdom of God. And yes, sometimes that means in our career. And yes, sometimes that means in our families. Sometimes that means in X, Y, or Z space of our life. But oftentimes it's a cutting away of things that have become inhibitors to our fruitfulness. 
In his book, uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, John Mark Comer writes this, Hurry and love are incompatible. Hurry and love are incompatible. One of the answers I hear most when asking people about outreach and specifically events is, I don't have the time. I'm too busy. And I believe you. <laughs> Because I often feel that same way too. I don't have time to do this. I can't add on, so I'm going to set up a boundary. Right? Like that's, that's what we've learned to do now in our culture. We're figuring out what boundaries look like. But I'm afraid that we've set up boundaries in the wrong spots. That we have said no to the things that God wants us to say yes to. And we've said yes to the things that God wants to say no to. This book is incredible. If, I don't know if any of you have read it, but I would encourage you, if you feel like your life is a little too rushed, a little too hurried, this will be a book that convicts you just as it convicts me. That I need to intentionally slow down my life in order to love. Because that's part of what abiding is, is loving others. He says this over and over again, starting in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Down in verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than, like love is essential to the disciple. But hurry and love are incompatible. Abiding has to do with love and therefore has to do with your time. So what does God need to prune from your life? And this is, again, this is not easy. These are not just, oh, I just need to cut this out. Sometimes it is that easy. But sometimes it's aspects of our work. Sometimes it's our hobbies. Sometimes it's our own extracurriculars. Maybe the really tough ones for parents is sometimes it's our, our kids' extracurricular activities. Maybe it's our screens, our addiction to screen time. As I was preparing for this message and I was in Shalom on Wednesday night, I, I removed myself briefly to journal a little bit and I said, God, what do you want to prune from me? Because I, I never want to be someone that preaches this and then doesn't do anything about it myself. And it was very quick in my mind of like, you've been watching too much TV again. You've been watching too many shows at night. The one show at night has turned into two, and then on the weekends it's two or three or four. That's hours of my life that I could be giving for the love of other people. So what is it for you? What aspect needs to be removed? Maybe it's an insecurity that you have. An insecurity of, of what it's going to be like when you cross the street to talk to your neighbor or cross the lawn or when you have to talk to someone at lunch other than your best friend at work, the, per the one person you know really well. But what does it look like to actually talk with more people at your work sphere or at school with the friends that aren't a part of your main friend group? We can become very fearful and insecure as these things happen. But I promise you this, God wants to continue to cut away the insecurity to prune that from you because the truth is that he has placed his Holy Spirit in us. Just read chapter 14 of John. It's over and over again. He is in us. And this spirit is not of fear or timidity. It's of power, of a sound mind, right? Like it's, it's, this one is within us already. We just have to prune off our insecurities. Maybe our, our, uh, what we need to be pruned uh, by the Father is some of our apathy towards the lost. Some of our apathy towards those around us who don't yet know Jesus. Maybe it's our comfort. We love to be comfortable in America. We love to have these things that make us feel good. But maybe some of those comforts have become something that is now taking your time and energy and attention and is becoming unfruitful there. And God wants you to prune it off. He wants to remove that from your life so that you can be more fruitful over in this sphere of life that may be uncomfortable, but will further the kingdom of God. That's the vision of this church, is not just to declare Christ to you, even though we want to do that every single week, but it's to declare Christ to those around us, for you to be doing that with your friends and family and your coworkers and your neighbors. That's the deploy part of our church, and the declare part is what we should all be doing as Christians. Maybe what needs to be pruned is sin. And that's that's low-hanging fruit in a sense. Like that's like the easy one. But maybe we need to take a step back and examine ourselves once again. Do I have a sin of greed or gluttony? 
of gossip or lust, hatred, resentment, or an attitude of constant complaint about this or that at home or at work or at church or at the playground or wherever it is. You know, you go into a store, you can pick stuff apart. These are unfruitful vines that we have allowed to uh, come out of us that are now taking our lifeblood and our energy into an area that will not produce good fruit. And so we need to chop that sin off so that we can continue to bear fruit for Jesus. As long as we keep these other things connected to us, we will be less fruitful. And as we're less fruitful, you will have less joy. I guarantee it. John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. I have told you this. I've told you to remain in me, to abide in me, to follow in my footsteps, to obey my commands. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. If you feel like you are lacking in joy, ask God what it is he wants to prune away from you. Because I guarantee as you prune those things, painful though they are temporarily, it will produce a fruit that brings you greater joy in life. So abiding in Jesus requires believing. Abiding in Jesus requires pruning by the Father. And abiding in Jesus, third and, and our final point, is it results in the fruit of the Spirit. It results in fruit. Okay, John 15, 4 through 8. We're going to read it again. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We'll stop there. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we really believe this? If I'm honest with you, I don't think I believe this as much as I want to believe it. Because I can be very good at looking like I'm bearing fruit of the Spirit, looking like I'm producing good things apart from Christ. As Christians, we have become notoriously good at bearing fruit in front of people, but then when we are in the privacy or comfort of our own homes, we can see that we are truly just withering sticks that have been detached from the vine. Paul David Tripp talks about this as stapling fruit on a dead tree. But that's essentially what we do when we try to produce this ourselves without being connected to God in His Word. As we are simply trying to staple dead fruit, or staple fruit onto a dead tree. I love that imagery. And why I bring this up is because this message is not a call for you to work harder to strive a little more, to grit and get down and really just do all the hard things. The call for this message is really the abiding aspect because it's when we abide in Jesus, we will bear fruit. We don't have to bear fruit in order to abide in Jesus. We have to abide in Jesus in order to bear fruit. So the call is not for you to leave and for my students to feel like they have this list of to-dos, they have a bunch of stuff they have to accomplish in order to remain in Jesus. No, it's simply this, remain in Jesus and you will bear fruit. We have too narrow a view often of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think it's just for salvation. We think it's just something that we need to proclaim to the lost and then we forget about the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's provided. I, had, I heard it explained just this weekend that the gospel is like the, the wardrobe of the Chronicles of Narnia. That that initial step in is you being received into the family of God. That that is the entryway of, of life, is that gospel. But as you continue to walk through, you realize that there is a world in there, a world in the gospel that you can now walk into and live and enjoy. 
That the gospel is not just the doorway, but the gospel is everything then through there. The good news of Jesus Christ is for life eternal, which means not just life in the moment and then eternal life later. It's life eternal starting today and moving forward. Let's continue to expand our view of the gospel because if we want to move forward as a church with this vision of declare, develop, and deploy in every area, we must learn how to do so not from a striving but from an abiding in Jesus, an utter dependence on him. And as I close, I want to point out that fruit really doesn't benefit the tree except that it's properly functioning in the way that God has designed it. The tree doesn't drop some fruit and then pick it up and eat more of it. Now, yes, okay, we can go into the, yes, it fertilizes, there's things like that. But like, just bear with me for a second. The fruit is for other people to partake in, right? When I go to the apple orchard, I'm going there to pick fruit off of the tree and to take a big old bite of it and to see how good it tastes. So fresh. If we feel that we are abiding in Jesus and you say, and I say, yes, I am bearing fruit, but it is benefiting nobody else except for myself, we are missing the point. Yes, the fruit of the Spirit is good. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things require relationship. Those things require other people benefiting. Like, I want to have self-control, and yeah, with myself, but I want to have self-control when someone is being really frustrating to me. I want to have patience, yes, with myself, yes, that's good. I want to have patience with the students that I love that just won't listen during small group. Like, I want to have this fruit, but if it's only benefiting yourself, you're like, yeah, I'm digging deeper into God's Word, and our, our small group is doing that, and I go to church on Sundays, and I feel like I'm bearing fruit, but there's no one outside of your own little sphere of Seth McCumber who is, being benefic- uh, who is benefiting from the fruit. We're missing the point. It's because in John 15, 16, he even says this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. To go and bear fruit. So really, that's the call that we have for our students. That's the call that we have for outreach ministries. I love Pastor Drew's vision for outreach, that it becomes something that's less church always putting on events that you guys have to try to plug into, and more an organic overflow of each person in their lives and in their work spheres, or their small groups that then develops a ministry that they want to do for six months or for a year or for ten years, whatever it may develop into. When outreach becomes organic... When outreach becomes organic, that's when we know we're truly abiding. Because abiding, it's tough for us to try to manufacture abiding. To try to force you to abide. Like, we can only do that ourselves. But as we do that, we have to make sure that our fruit is benefiting those around us. That we go and bear fruit. And so in closing, I just want to give a few testimonies from students. Mason uh, Eakins, who's now at, at Madison, he went to Spain with me. It was a, a great time with him. And as he returned from Spain, I remember him saying how much closer he felt with Jesus. Because what we did in Spain was a lot of abiding, a lot of depending on God. And he said, man, I didn't realize how important prayer was. And so this is, a, this is young, and I got his permission to say these things. This is a young man who grew up in the church and yet at 18 years old is now realizing how important it was to pray to Jesus, to abide with him. But God, in his goodness and his mercy, provided this opportunity for Mason to learn it, to learn to be developed as a believer, because within that next week of returning, seven days, he, uh, he and his girlfriend of three years broke up, and then his grandfather died. And he says that, he said, he doesn't think he would have been able to get through as well as he did if he had not just learned the practice of praying. And he said that's what he would do as he was out on their property. He would just pray and take it to God. God, why did we break up? And why did we break up right before my grandpa just died, a grandpa whom I love? And that doesn't just stop there. Now, he's been deployed into Madison, and there can be those concerns, even as a youth pastor, like, okay, what's he going to do now that he's at Madison? Like, UW, that's a a place. (laughs) 
There, there's, there's darkness there. But what he did was he said, he told me this before he went there, that he was praying that God would surround him with godly people. And he very, made, very quickly made some friends on his floor. And he actually didn't realize that they were Christians. They just became friends. And then someone was like, hey, there's this thing called InterVarsity. Or it might have been Crew. It's one of the two. You guys want to go? And they're like, oh, yeah, let's go. And he realizes that this friend group that he just happened to be in is a friend group to, that loves Jesus. And now they're inviting their other friends on their dorm floor to come to this ministry event for college students. <laughs> He learned what it was to abide in Jesus, to pray. And as he learned to pray, he actually got to see the fruit of that prayer. Twice in this passage, we, I didn't have time to highlight it, but it says, when you abide, ask whatever you want in my name and it will be given to you. Mason has the joy in him right now because he is, he's walking in obedience and as he has learned that, that aspect of prayer, he has been deployed in one of the darkest areas, I think, in Wisconsin to see the gospel go forth among people who are so unaware of the world of joy that they could be having. Another student, insecure. I had the joy of discipling him this summer. And as we walked through Scripture and as we walked through a, a book to talk about what it looks like to abide in Jesus and to know that as someone who is rooted in Jesus, that means your identity is drastically different than what anyone else says. And by the end of the time, by God's grace alone and by the work of the Spirit, he says, I no longer agree with what my friends and students would say that I'm just a dumb idiot because I know that I am a chosen child of God and so I'm going to keep walking in that. That's learning how to abide in Jesus. It removes insecurities and fills us with the power of the Spirit to walk in who we already are in Christ Jesus. We have another student who frequents the YMCA, plays basketball there. And she's been adamant to talk to some of the other uh, basketball players about coming to youth group. Adamant about praying for them. And what did we see three weeks ago? And now two weeks in a row, we have these students from the YMCA coming to youth group. And that night, we explicitly talked about the gospel of Jesus. That is a student who has learned to abide. And then as they bear fruit, it is benefiting those around them because they are realizing, hey, I'm deployed. I've been sent to go and bear fruit. And so I'm going to declare Christ wherever I am and try to get these people on board with this. Fruit doesn't just benefit the tree. It benefits others. And what we're seeing in the youth ministries is not at all anything that I can produce. This is not about me and not about the incredible leaders we have. It's simply about the students learning how to abide. And so that's the call today. Is what does God want to prune from you so that you can be more fruitful for his kingdom? What fruit are you bearing that not only benefits yourself, but benefits those around you? And ultimately, what are you doing to remain close, to abide with Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for this passage in John 15. Lord, that it teaches us that we don't have to strive and work harder, that it's not about us just doing more events. It's not just about us doing more and volunteering more within the church. Lord, that, if that has been communicated, that I'm just asking people to volunteer more, Lord, would you just remove that? Lord, would you just remind each of us in this room that it's not about volunteering more? It's not about trying to strive to do more. It's about abiding in you. And that as we do that, Lord, that as you prune things away from our lives that are distracting us from your kingdom, that you would give us a vision for how we can see your kingdom go forward, how we can see the gospel change in the lives of our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, those around us, Lord. Because, Lord, that is when we will see Bethel Church grow. When we will see Bethel Church accomplish this mission and this vision of declare, develop, deploy is only when we as a church realize that we need to abide in you and then let our fruit benefit those outside of us. Lord, we give you all these things and I pray that you continue to work on our hearts through the rest of this day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. As we stand in worship, let's spend some time abiding.